Hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about incremental proofs of sequential work, and it was very convenient that there was a talk before me, so I don't have to go through the same things again. But this is uh, again a talk, of, a talk about proof of sequential work. So just let me give you a brief introduction about the primitive. Um, so the idea is that um, the prover receives an input statement, then it does some work. The work takes approximately time n, and then the prover is able to find and to compute a small proof, um, which we call pi, such that the verifier, given the statement x and the proof pi, is able to say yes or no in the sense that he accepts or rejects the proof. And this is a very, very natural primitive to have, and there are many applications. And beyond, you know, like the classical blockchains, we, this, this can be used right off the box for doing things like CPU benchmarking or, you know, time stamping of a document. In general, it's a nice little primitive that, that, that we, I, I think we all agree that this deserves to be studied. Um, so let me, let me be slightly more formal, and this is going to be the last formal slide of the talk, so the get out of the way. And, um, so what we want from, from a proof of sequential work is, of course, completeness. Completeness means that uh, honest proof correctly verify. It's like sanity check, fine. Um, we want soundness. Soundness intuitively means that um, I cannot forge proof in time much less than n. And note that it is important here that, um, that the soundness is parameterized by a certain constant. Uh, this constant doesn't have to be universal in the sense that it's a constant that might show up, for example, in the proof size. Um, but uh, the sequentiality of the prover is required to be at least one minus constants times n. So in the sense there is some, some, some slack, it's not a perfect proof, you're allowed to make some, some shortcuts. As, not, you're, as, not, as long as you're not taking too many of those, then then we're OK with it. And if you are too short, then, then we want this. Uh, the, we want that the verifier rejects your proof with all but negligible probability. And throughout the next, the next talk, by time, I mean uh, random oracle queries. And number of random oracle queries, it's easy to show that, that in the random oracle model, repeated queries are inherently sequential. right? So by, you can substitute time with random oracle queries. And we have some efficiency requirement which makes the, 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 the primitive non-trivial. Um, the primitive has to, has to have short proof uh, and fast verification in the sense that you need, don't want to go through the whole computation again. And we want additionally to be non-interactive. By non-interactive, I mean that there is just a single proof that gets exchanged from the prover to the verifier and publicly verifiable, which was exactly the point that, that you raised before, so I'm, I'm glad that I actually put it here. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's publicly verifiable. Everyone should be able to verify the proof. And, well, this is a bonus feature, which is due to the fact that our construction achieves it, and that the fact that you can extend uh, queries for, for parameters greater than, than the fixed n without, of course, starting over. And this is, you know, uh, for example, this, is, this feature is useful for, um, for the time stamping when you know, the, your computer or your hardware is, are, is prone to, to some failure and you don't want to start over every time your machine shuts down. Right? So it, the, you, you compute the proof up to a certain point, you can fork, you, it's, it's, it's an interesting feature and it's good to have it. Um, okay, so now these this slides require a bit of imagination in the sense that I didn't put any constant here. You substitute with your favorite constant. And I didn't put all the related work here um, because of space issues. Um, but like RSW is all captured by, by this. So that being said, um, let, me, let me quickly summarize the feature of, of what's known. So the first two are uh, construction of proof of sequential work. The first uh, was uh, from Mahmoud et al., which we call MMV. And the second one is from uh, Cohen Peter Chuck, and I don't want to slaughter anybody's surname, so it's CP. Okay. So the first, the first construction was was the motivating exam motivating work of this of this line of work, and it achieves uh, essentially uh, logarithmic proof size and verifier complexity, which is nice, but it had a a prover memory complexity proportional to nf. If you think that n is something around 2 to the 40, 
this is like typical parameters of n. It requires really a lot of memory. So and this is why this is where the the, the kind Peter CP construction um, uh, improved a lot, and they they had this very elegant idea to use this nice graph that we saw we saw in the talk before, and they they they. They managed to bring down the prover, the prover memory complexity all the way to log n. However, this came at a slight cost in the sense that uh, the prover computation is now 2n as opposed to n. And we'll see in a minute where does, where does this come from. And let me mention that, that they, also, they also outline a, they also have a, have a trade off where they managed to trade a little bit of prover computation for, for, uh, for decreasing the, the, the prover memory. This, in practice, is very good, but you know, the, there is, this motivates the question whether we can get you know, the best of both worlds. Um, OK, let me mention all this, both these constructions. They are based uh, only on, on random oracles. And, um, and there is no, no, no additional assumption. They are both, uh, both very, very simple and very easy to implement and practically efficient. Um, right, so now it comes to the, the rest of the machinery. Of course, as, as we discussed before, uh, a verifiable delay function is a proof of sequential work. Um, it is a stronger primitive, and as such, uh, it requires at least, we, it's conjecture that it requires stronger assumption. We, we, know, we know new constructions, very recent construction, and they're presented at this conference. Um, that uh, take the RSW par paradigm and use the sequentiality of, of, of squaring over the order group plus random oracles, uh, but they, they essentially achieve the best of both of, of whole words. They are incremental and they, they get best parameters asymptotically. And well, then of course, if we go one level one level above in the hierarchy, then we get uh, incremental verifiable computation, which is a verifiable delay function, and it's again, of course, a proof of sequential work. And but this is this is a really a really involved machinery. This builds on on, on 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 recursive compositions of snarks. So as far as I'm aware, the only two constructions one uses a random oracle in a non-black box way, so it's unclear what it means. And the other one uses pairings, but 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 as a trusted setup. So then this brings me to our result. Uh, we are interested in the first setting, so in the simple proof of sequential works based on random oracles only. Uh, and we want to have best parameters possible, uh, meaning polylogarithmic uh, prover complexity in terms of memory and, and, and linear with, with constant one uh, prover, co prover computation. And we propose two constructions. The first uh, achieves, uh, is asymptotically optimal. Uh, but uh, as an extra uh, square factor in the in the in the prover memory, uh, but it it's, it runs on a single processor. Um, whereas our second construction, uh, it it uh, it removes this 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 square in, uh, from the from the prover memory, but it requires some parallelism from the prover. And we can bound the parallel the number of parallel processors to log n. Which is, which is, I think, is a reasonable, is a reasonable assumption. I'll talk more about that later. And bonus feature: both both constructions are incremental. Both constructions are practically efficient, and they are based only on random oracles. Okay, so this is the one slide about uh, the CP construction that I want to that I want to give you as a glimpse. So this is the graph that we saw in the previous talk. And as you can see, you can, you can think of this as a miracle tree with some extra edges, for example, this one and, and, and this one. And I highlighted in red the traversal order. So this is the order in which the prover computes the node. So a very, very executive summary about this. Um, the, how, does this how does this proof of sequential work work? Um, the prover computes, starts computing this graph, uh, goes through the all computation, then once it gets to the root, it applies the Fiat-Shamir transformation and gets a set S of challenged leaves. Right? Uh, now, for all these leaves, S, E returns the, the Merkle commitment. So let's say that, this, that, this, that one of these leaves is here, and he has to return the path 
plus all the siblings. And given all this information, then the verifier can verify indeed that, that this is correctly, correctly formed and that the hash are indeed computed correctly. And, um, and this is repeated in parallel to boost soundness, but this is not, not really important. Um, all right, I didn't tell you how the, how the labels are computed. Well, essentially, if you take a node, the label of the node consists of uh, the hash of all the, of all the labels of the node with an incoming edge. Okay, so this is, this is it. Um, but what's the problem? Where does, the, where does the, the, the computational slack come from? Well, the problem comes from the fact that you don't know the set f of challenge leaf until you get to the root. And the root is actually the last step of the computation, right? So you have no idea which, uh, which leaves you should keep in memory until you get at the end of the computation. And that's already end steps. So how do you, how do you solve this? Uh, well, there are, there are several solutions, but the naive way, in a sense, is you, know, you just compute everything, and either you keep the old graph in the memory, that is not good because that goes back to having a really large memory, or you recompute, in the worst case, the whole graph. And again, let me stress that there is a, there is a trade off which, is, uh, which brings this memory and the hover to square root of n. But the question is can we do better? Okay? And, and this, is, this, is, this is where our work, this is the idea of our work. So, just before you tell me how ah, this is trivial, I'm just presenting the idea in plain text, and for the, the, the math, I refer you to the paper. I just want to give you a very, very high level. Uh, idea of our of our of our construction. So the idea, the basic idea, is actually very simple. Instead of waiting until the root to sample the leaf, we start accumulating and pruning leaves throughout the computation of the graph. So this is what happens, for example, uh, at node v. Um, let's say that that our our lambda is actually the, uh, the in, in this slide is the set of challenges, so the, the, the cardinality of the set. And uh, it, you, you can think of this as the hardness parameter of the, of the scheme. Um, so now at this point, for the node L, we have exactly three paths. And for the node R, we have exactly three paths. So everything is fine. And once we get to node V, then the idea is to apply phi shamir to, to the node v, and this will index a subset of size 3 of all this, of all this path. So what we do is simply we drop the path which do not belong to this subset. And of course, for, for, for reasonable values of lambda, for high def nodes, so at the very beginning of the computation, we'll just keep all the leaves, right? And the more we get higher up to the tree, well, the more we start pruning and forgetting about about um, about uh, path that that we do that we do not need, and note that as soon as the path is forgotten, we don't need it anymore. Because what we do is just pruning uh, gradually as we go up to to, to the tree. And the, the 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 conceptual difference is that instead of performing Fiat Shamir at the very end of the computation, we do it at each node, sort of, except for the for the for the very high depth node. Uh, OK, so let me, give you, let me give you a quick glimpse of the algorithm. And this is, again, it's a very simplified version, but this is the backbone of the, of the ideas. From, I think from here, you can all reconstruct the, the algorithm. So the prover starts the computation of the same graph of CP uh, log n. And if we define SR and SL to be the challenge set for each node v, so first we check whether um, whether they exceed the parameter lambda. And as such, we uh, apply phi shamir so using a random oracle, to the node v. And we take uh, s, we define s to be a random lambda size subset uh, of sr uh, concatenated with sl. Otherwise, uh, if, if, if they are not, not large enough, we just keep s to be the union. Um, the verifier is identical as cp. The only difference is that, uh, additionally, to check the correct labeling of the graph and uh, to, uh, yeah, to check that the response is actually well formed, the verifier is also to check whether we uh, prune the correct branches. Right? We, need, we, we need to check that the, 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 the subset is, is correctly chosen. 
And this can be done by simply recomputing the hash uh, of the node and, and parsing this appropriately as a, as a subset. Um, well, now it's very easy to see that um, we have at most log n, uh, log n nodes in the memory, and we have at most lambda times log n loop, root, uh, root to leaf paths in the memory, so the space complexity of this, of this construction is roughly lambda uh, log, log n squared. And this is actually not where the, where the source of inefficiency comes from. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Oh, and, and, and let, me, let, me, let me highlight that this scheme is naturally incremental in the sense that there is absolutely nothing special about the root, the root node. You could just keep going, right? There is, this, there is no reason to, to stop at, at, at the root. Just the, the paths are already there in memory, and you can just keep going. And, 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 and even, even after the computation. So the, the, incre the incremental feature comes essentially for free. So now the, 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 the catch is that the, the, the analysis gets a bit more involved because now the proof can cheat adaptively. So what, what the prover can do is that he can start some computation, see if some favorable, uh, some favorable subset of nodes is chosen, then go back and change, change labels, introduce mistake, and this, this, this uh, messes up a lot. And that's why we need to throw a lot of tail bounds uh, to, to, into our analysis. And, but this increases, this is, uh, increases significantly the challenge set lambda. Uh, so we need, in order to account for this adaptivity, we essentially need to check many more paths. This is the moral behind this. It's still fine, uh, in the sense that it's still polylogarithmic, but there is a square factor when you compare to CP18. So our next idea is, a, is based on an extremely simple observation. Uh, so take any, any balance miracle tree, right? Once the left, tree, once the left subtree is computed, well, then it will take exactly the same amount of time to compute the right subtree. So that means that for this left subtree, we actually have enough time to run the CP18 strategy uh, and recompute even the left subtree. This doesn't matter. Right? We just spawn a parallel processor, and um, and this and, and, and as long as we have enough parallelism, this this uh, doesn't really affect the running time because the moment I need those paths, I will be done with the computation. And uh, so the, the idea is very simple: use essentially a hybrid approach between what I, what I just described and the idea of CP18. And I hope that this image. Uh, help you understanding what, what's going on. And so essentially, this is the left subtree that I was talking about. So what happens is that my prover starts with the computation, it gets up to this point, and up to this point, it, there is one, the main thread continues the computation of this subtree, whereas this spawns a parallel thread that goes and recomputes the challenge path. So in, for this subtree, the Fiat Shamir is just applied at this node. We don't need to bother applying it, uh, doing our on the fly sampling strategy. Um, and the point is that we will merge the two subsets uh, at, at this point, but, and we will need the, 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 the path that come out of this, out of this subtree, but we will need them only uh, when this node is also computed, and it will take exactly the same time because it's a balance tree, okay? And it's very easy to see that, that you can, there is a very easy proof such that it allows you to bound the number of parallel processors used at all time to log n. And just, I mean, there are, the log n is a really reasonable, uh, uh, if, you t if you take into account that there are two to the 80 atoms in the universe, uh, take log n equal 80, you have 80 processors, it's fine. You, the, the, there exists a machine with 80 processors, so good. And the point is that, what was, what was the point of this mess? The point is that now we do not have to throw so many tail bounds because we have no adaptivity already in this full subtree, right? And w you can already see where we have to throw a tail bound. It's here, 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 and so on. But it's very little with respect I mean, when compared to the old three. And now our, 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 our parameters get much better and we get proof of size approximately a factor of nine. Uh, greater than CP18, which is, you know, if you think if you think that this gives you uh, essentially uh, optimal prover complexity and uh, uh, and the incrementality feature almost for free, it seems to be a reasonable price to pay. Okay, so let me just give you give you uh, a bit of uh, conclusion. I like to, I like to 
then conclude with some open problems. So what we showed in this talk is a proof of sequential work which is asymptotically optimal with respect to prover efficiency. It comes from simple and well understood assumption and it is completely efficient and, and simple to implement. And I think it's a nice, it's a nice idea and I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that this idea will find other applications. Um, so then open problems if are of course, can we, can we get unique, unique proof? Of course, you can using verifiable delay function, maybe something simpler. It's a good question. Um, well, avoid random oracles. This is also always an interesting, an interesting question. And find other application of this on-the-fly sampling technique. Uh, you, can, you, can imagine, you can think of this as, uh, as some sort of random probing over some data stream whenever you cannot go back to the data and you need to, f to sample some probe in some verifiable way. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have some ideas how to use this technique, please come talk to me, I'm very interested. Uh, okay, this is it. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? So when you mix your technique with uh, CP18, I wonder if you lose something in terms of incrementality because uh, so I don't I, I, ah. I'm not sure I completely understood how you achieve it. But actually, if CP18 is not incremental, then and some part of your proof is using CP18, then no. So the point, yeah, no, good, that's a that's a very good question. So the point is that l imagine imagine that we are at this point, right? Um, yeah, the proof, the proof will not be incremental. The, the, the CP18 is not incremental, but the point is that if we, if we keep going on, upon this way, then we have enough time to recompute the old path and to do the, the trivial incrementation. Uh, so that the end proof in the end is incremental. And uh, so is there a reason why you just always go to the left, uh, like this, you have this particular structure of the... Ah, uh, no, this, this, this comes, uh, why, why we start from the left and yeah. not the right? You know? Or, I don't know, like alternating or something like that? Uh, um, no, this is because of the, of the structure of CP18. Of CP ah, it, it, yeah. it has to go on this specific order, right? So that's, that's why. And this parameter lambda, what's, who chooses it? And is it, no, does it, it depend is, on the... It's fixed. It's, it's, it's the hardness of the system. So, I mean, a lambda was just for the sake of the talk. We have a more fine-grained uh, okay. abstraction. Any other questions? So I had a, uh, a question. So in, in this construction, you're essentially basing it on, on CP18. Yeah, the, the there, there's the, the, the tree, which is uh, basically uh, a power of two. Mm -hmm. So can you have number of iterations, amount of work that is not a power of two? I mean, you can by the, the, the way, we, yes, you, you, it works. Uh, you have just a log, a, log, uh, a log factor by just taking the power of two, essentially. <laughs> but yeah, it's not very satisfactory. <laughs> okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, then let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>